Turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and <clears throat> you're thinking, man, Second Corinthians, we're in Romans. Last week, we are all over the place. We are a little bit. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21 is going to be our passage. The reason we are in uh, different passages and have been now for, I think this is our, our fourth week, is we're going through nine marks of a healthy church. And so, nine marks of a healthy church and just a little bit of a refresher, reminder if you've been here through them all, and if you haven't, maybe a reminder for us nonetheless. Uh, nine marks of a healthy church, and so the first was this, expositional preaching. So basically exposing God's word. Again, you don't need to hear from me, you need to hear from God. And God has spoken to us through his word. And so expositional preaching is what we're a church of. We believe a healthy church uh, preaches expositionally. Biblical theology, really meaning that we're looking at the whole story of the Bible. What is the uh, the whole story of it, this idea of redemption, and of course, starting with God, ending with God. It's all about Him and His glory, and making sure that we preach in such a way that we have our biblical theology in place. And then third was the gospel. Gospel, again, beginning with God. It's good news. We need good news. We said that. We have the good news of Jesus Christ, and we preach the gospel of Christ, not the gospel of other things. Uh, those things might be good, but it's not the gospel, and it's not the good news of Christ, what we need. And then today is conversion. <clears throat> so we talked last week, we need the gospel. This week we need change. We need conversion. Uh, nine marks, actually, it's interesting. There's an article I caught in my email just a couple weeks ago, and it was on conversion, and so I'm going to read this to you. I think it's helpful. A uh, definition, conversion is a U-turn in a person's life. <clears throat> it is turning with one's whole person away from sin and to Christ for salvation, from idol worship to God worship, from self-justification to Christ justification, from self-rule to God's rule. Uh, this is the change that we need. This is conversion. This is what our passage is speaking of. And so with this in mind, I want to read the passage aloud. And if you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into God's Word together. And so, 2 Corinthians 5, <clears throat> starting at verse 17, and I'll read it to the end of that chapter. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We need change. We need to be converted. Uh, let me pray, if you pray with me, and then let's look at this together. Heavenly Father, we uh, again thank you for another Sunday. This is not just another Sunday, Father. What a privilege that we have to have our Bibles open and to and to hear from you, Lord, to look at what our God says to us, to Redemption Church. Father, we thank you for this, and we do not want to take it for granted. We ask right now, then, for help. We pray, uh, keep us on track as we've sung. Be our vision. Lord, would you uh, show us who you are and what you've done, and then what difference that makes. Father, you are worthy of our praise. When we think about conversion, we pray, Father, that uh, if there's anyone here that has not been converted, not been uh, changed and made new, Lord, that that would happen today would be the day of salvation. And for us who are, that we'd remember what's happened. Lord, that the, the fact of what has taken place would be something that we would always come back to and that we would continue to preach. And Father, it would um, cause us to be uh, glorifying to you in the way that we live as, as converted, as changed uh, disciples of you now, redeemed worshipers. And so, Father, I just pray too, Lord, would you uh, help me, the preacher, as I preach. Father, I, 
I pray that you would help. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word and just acknowledge that you know what your church needs better than I ever would. You are the counselor, you are the shepherd, Christ is the head of this church. So speak through your word, it's fitting that you would do that. Lord, just guard my mouth, keep me from saying things that would not be helpful. Lord, bring to mind things I need to say. And Father, would you apply it directly to each person here, each soul? Father, we're asking you to do this. Lord, we don't deserve it, but would you do it, please? Would you be uh, glorified in it? And Lord, uh, would we be changed for the good from it? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, uh, coming to this passage, thinking of change, knowing even maybe what, uh, maybe a definition, at least man's definition of conversion would be. I'll just say this again, similar to last Sunday, you know, we need good news. Uh, we need change. And that kind of goes hand in hand, good news, and we need change. It's, there's lots of overlap here for sure, uh, but we do need change. It's we do this at times too. Maybe you're into arts and crafts. I don't know. Um, I'm not really, but in some ways, I guess I kind of am. Uh, once I took a bunch of broken hockey sticks and I made a table out of them in college with very limited tools. I still have the thing somewhere in the house. I don't know if it's in the boys' bedroom. Okay. You know, you take something and you're like, this is all broken. Uh, it's not for its original purpose. And then you convert it into something. My grandpa, I remember being in awe as a kid. He did the unthinkable and he took a furnace that was broken took out the motor and he made uh, a grinder with it. And I was like, my grandpa's a genius. Now, maybe some of you are like, that's ah, easy to look. That's a big deal. You take a furnace and you make it into a grinder, a bench grinder, you have my respect. And the, the most that I kind of ever did as a kid was take my jeans that had holes in them and uh, cut them into jean shorts with the permission of my mom. Just so you know, kids. Uh, but we take things and we say like, man, this thing needs a change. And so we kind of understand, like, yeah, I've seen that maybe in my life and some things that needed to be changed and made useful, you could say. Uh, there's always this need, though, in our, in our lives for change. And we see it around us in broken things, for sure, but in, in ourselves, for sure. And we feel the need for it all the time. And maybe, maybe for you, you're thinking, like, today, like, yeah, yeah, I kind of feel that at a personal level. Like, I need a change of job, maybe. Um, you know, I need a change of plans, a change of location, a change of medication, a change of clothes, uh, maybe, guys, your wife's like, you need a change of clothes. Uh, maybe I need something other than plaid. I don't know, for Sunday, right? Uh, you know, I need a change in my marriage, a change in just relationships, change in the government, a change in my thinking, my habits, my priorities, and like the list goes on. I would say, yes, a change is good, and, and in many ways, maybe you do need those changes. I don't know. But that's not, it, change, in fact, is not what we need. We need conversion. And there's, and there's a difference, and there's a big difference. If, if we just preach, if I just preach to you change, and, and you can have a new marriage by Tuesday, or here's some benefits to this, or benefits to that, and new kids, and the rest of it, um, that might be helpful at some level, but it won't last, because it's not conversion. It's not an actual change. What we need, actually, is conversion, and a healthy church will not be content just to seek just changes. We, we want to seek conversion, which is true change, a complete change, a a change of relationship between uh, you and God. That's conversion. A, a complete change at the deepest level where he says, uh, you're no longer an enemy, you're now a son. Or you're not, no longer apart from me, but you're together. There's an actual change going on. A change from, and we'll see this in this passage, and we read it, maybe you saw it. Old to new, or a debtor to free. Or uh, not just the state of being in debt, but now free, but like a position, like you're counted as unrighteous, but now your position actually changes to righteousness. And, and this actually applies to all of life. It actually applies to these changes that we say, man, I think I need these changes. This must be sought after. This must be preached. This must be remembered and celebrated. And I would say this, this must happen. You and I need to have actual change that happens in our life. And because it's actual change, and not just something that the world can offer, which might help to certain levels, but because it's an actual change, a conversion actually only happens from God. And it is good and we need it and it's God's work. And you need to hear that today. The, the change that we want to preach as a church is going to be the change of conversion, really. And it's a work of God. And that's our big idea today is conversion is a work of God. It's a work of God. It's not a work of man. 
And if you've had any time trying to make changes in your life, <laughs> in your own strength, in your own wisdom, you want to talk about the most frustrated place you'll be in in your life. We've all been there. Change is a work of God. Our first point is this, God converts the old to the new. So conversion is a work of God and God converts the old to the new. So look at our passage again, verse 17. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He says, therefore. And so preachers sometimes will be like, when you see therefore, you need to ask, what's it there for? It's a fun way, maybe kids, you can remember that. Therefore, you have to be like, well, something went on. He says, therefore. He's making some sort of conclusion. So if you go back in your, in your Bible and look at verses 14 to 16, I think he's kind of really looking back at this, primarily those couple verses. And so 14 to 16, really he's saying this. He's in, just to summarize it for you, uh, Jesus died, which means you died. If you're in Christ, he died, you died. He lived, lives, he, he rose again, you live, and now you can live not for yourself, but for him. Okay, that's a reality. That's something that's taken place spiritually in our lives. Living not for ourselves, but for God. And so we would just say this, if this is the case, then he goes on to say, we don't look at people in earthly ways, in worldly ways anymore. We used to look at Jesus that way, he said, but we don't look at Jesus that way anymore. Jesus was a carpenter, a teacher. You could even say, wow, a miracle worker. But he says, we don't look at him that way anymore. We look at Jesus for who he is, for what he's done. Why did he die? We don't just look at him like, well, someone died. You hear people say, Jesus died for you, and he rose again. We're like, well, lots of people died for lots of people. Rising again, that sounds a little freaky, but okay. But no, 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 we don't look at it worldly anymore. We say, no, he is the son of God, and he bore your sin and shame, and that's why he died. So he bore that, and then he rose again because he was a worthy sacrifice. This is different. So we don't look at him the same way. We look at him differently. What he did wasn't natural. So we look at him differently. And our view of him is different. Our view of ourselves then is different too, is what Paul's saying. So we look at Jesus different, but then look at what he did for us. We look at ourselves differently. And so he says, therefore, like in light of that, we have a different view then of us. We should as a church, you should view yourself differently than just, man, I'm trying to make some changes. He says, no, no, therefore, listen, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So if anyone is in Christ, and we hear that lots, you'll hear that lots through the Bible. In Christ, really, you could say is united with Christ. If anyone is united with him, that means uh, they've died with him. And now we're talking about things that are spiritual, right? We, they've rose with him. They're in Christ, they're trusting in him, then that means they're unified with him. So if that's taken place, he says, they are converted. They are new. They are a new creation. We fight against this. Our flesh fights against this. So that is a good word. That is good news. We are, we are made new. But maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you felt it. Or maybe you feel it now. Like, well, I kind of feel like I'm on a bit of a spiritual journey. You know, I'm just, and people say that. They're like, let me tell you about my spiritual journey. <clears throat> and I say, be very careful about that. Depending on what you mean by that, that can be very worldly thinking, um, a view according to, the man, according to man, according to the flesh. So people say, I'm on this journey. It's, it's sort of like, though, if you're talking about conversion, if you're talking about, has the change happened or not? Like, are you a new, are you a new creation? You're like, wow, I'm kind of on this journey. <clears throat> it's like saying with a car, it's like, hey, look, if, I've tuned up my car, I've given it a wash, and, you know, it's like it's brand new. Right? It, it, it's, it's like there's been this change. Um, it's, a, it's a new model, but, but it's not. We know it's not. And you're like, well, it's kind of working towards that. It's kind of on this journey. It's like, it's actually not. It's on a journey away. Um, he's saying here, it's like, no, 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 this is a new creation. So it, it's not a journey to try to like fix it up, tune it up, and it's like new. It's like, no, 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 it's, it is a new creation. The 20, I don't know, 2024 version, the 2024 model is like here. It's it, and it's not going to wear out. You are a new creation. 
And Paul remembers writing to, if you didn't know this, he's writing to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is not like the poster child of like a good church. They struggled horrifically. If you, if you read 1 Corinthians um, it's in entirety, the book, it is shocking what Paul was addressing. And so he wrote 1 Corinthians to what they were going through and bringing reform to that. And he also wrote, it seems like another letter, he had this visit that was tough, and then another letter, and it didn't go well as well, it was a difficult letter. And now 2 Corinthians, it's like the same. We're bringing a message to a church that doesn't have a great track record. And so they could have easily said, like, we're on a journey. We're kind of like, hey, are you a new creation? You know, Corinthian church, are you a new creation? They'd be like, ah, kind of on a journey. Got some tune-up to do. Paul's saying to the Corinthian church, no, no, you're a new creation in Christ. Like the 2024 version is here and Christ says that's you. And you need to hear that this morning. In Christ, you are new. You're not working towards it. You need to hear that. You are new. They need to be convinced of that, Paul figured. And so this is a work of God. They need to prove their newness. Look how new I am. Look how tuned up I am. It's kind of like it's a brand new thing, right? No, no, no. You can know, Corinthian church, so redemption church, that you're new. It's a work of God. New creation, and unless maybe you think like, okay, I hear that, but new things get broken. Like I'm at the, ma- I'm just so you know, I have a spiritual gift of breaking things. I'm almost not allowed to wear new clothing because I will stain it. I just have this supernatural ability to wreck things. And we know this and we may think like, I'm new, but I know what it's like to have something new and then it gets broken. If you have a dog, you know that. If you have children, you're like, how is that even possible it was 12 seconds, and now it's broken. And maybe you say things with that in mind, then you say, like, I'm new, but, like, I've done some things, or, or like, I've, I'm even doing some things, like, like, this week did not respond the way that I needed to. I certainly am not acting as if I'm new. I've gone through some things. People say things like, uh, something happened to them and they'll say like, I'll never be the same. Maybe you've said that yourself. Or you've heard someone say that. I'll just never be the same. And I want to say on some levels, yes, there's some, there is some truth to that. But there's a lie in that too. If you think because of that, you are no longer a new creation. Then God has failed. Be very careful with that. Like, I'll just never be the same. That, that's not Conversion. You want to talk about never being the same. That's God taking what's old, part of the flesh, dead, and making it alive. He says here, verse 17, the old has passed away. It's not going to come back. It's passed away. It's gone. It's, if you're into gardening, try to find your garden from last year. If you of you who don't garden, you're like, oh, I don't know. Where, where, like, you won't find it, Okay. It's dead. The tomatoes are gone. The plants are gone. He says it's passed away. It's gone. It no longer exists. And then he says, look at verse 17 again. So he's telling us this. Right? New creation. The old is past. Then he says, listen, like behold. Remember our series through uh, the Beatitudes? Behold. Behold. Christ says behold. The Holy Spirit of God says right now, behold. So we listen. He's like, listen, listen. Like behold. The old's past. Now Listen. You need to hear this. The, the new has come. It's here. That's you and I in Christ. It's come. In John 3, Jesus described it as being born again. New. New, it's of God. It's a work of God. Nicodemus is like, I don't get it. God's like, this is a work of the Spirit. Brand new. So you can't make yourself new and you can't make the new old. And there's a good word for us. I mean, how many times do I just feel like I messed it up? I am not new. Then you're looking at yourself and you're not looking at the cross, the one who converts, the one who takes the old and makes it new. And this is a good word for us. Conversion is a work of done, or, or work of God. It's done, it's complete, it's good, it's finished. And it's initiated by God. Notice verse 18. This is God's initiation. Like 
He's doing this. And so all of this, Paul says, is from God. It's all from God. All this. All this meaning what we looked at before. Verses 14 to 16. Dying, rising with Christ, giving us the ability to live for Him, being made a new creation. All that is from God. So it's from Him. That means He's the source of this. And then He's also the initiator of it. So it says, this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. So again, I said this last week with propitiation. I don't know, like, being reconciled, that's a more common word, reconciliation. You maybe would use this word. I think it's helpful for us to know, okay, what is going on though when he says here, okay, there's a change. There's a conversion from one thing to the next. And so what, is he, what does he mean by reconciliation now though? This is happening through reconciliation. Well, Matthew Henry again um, you know, no surprise, but he's one of my favorite commentators. And he says this, <clears throat> reconciliation supposes a quarrel. Again, kind of old English, but not like super old English. I can actually understand it. But he's got this, it supposes. It means, uh, it, it assumes that someone's fighting. There's a quarrel or a breach of friendship. And sin has made a breach. It has broken the friendship between God and man. So that's happened. The heart of the sinner is filled with enmity against God. And so hatred, we're an enemy of God. And anyone who hasn't come to Christ, they may not say, I hate God, but you do until you come to trust in Christ. So we are an enmity against him, and God is justly offended with us as a sinner. Yet behold, there may be a reconciliation. So he says, this is how we're brought together. Offended majesty of heaven is willing to be reconciled. So God is willing, and this is the thing, initiated by him, God is willing to be reconciled to you. He's willing. He has appointed the mediator of reconciliation. He has reconciled us to himself, and the mediator is Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. Conversion is a work of God. Conversion is a work of God, but it comes with work to do. Listen to verse 18. It goes on. Gave us the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. It is entirely a work of God, and then still, yet, he gives us something to do. This ministry. So you could say like, <clears throat> you know, hey, you should meet my minister, uh, Pastor Kyle. Uh, in a sense, fine, that's, that's fine. Uh, you are all ministers. If you're in Christ, hear this, you're a minister. You're ministering. This idea, this humble servant's service of what? What's your title? Ministry of reconciliation. So this is a job that you're given. It's not a job where God's like, uh, sort of like a summer job. You just kind of take it. It's like, I don't know. You got to do something. You're idle. You got to make some money or something. And you know, you just take a summer job. It could be different every summer. You take it for a season. Maybe it's not your favorite. Uh, this is a job with purpose and intent. And so you are actually created and converted, hear this, for this job. This is your job. You're, you could say you're made for this job. People say like, I was born for this. You were born again for this, to be a minister of reconciliation. So if that's the case, then I'm guessing you a desire that people would be reconciled. You desire to bring care for people, and I hope you do. And so if we desire to bring care to people, my question is, what's the greatest care that first of all came into your life? If we're to minister reconciliation, think about that. We're bringing care. We're bringing reconciliation. The greatest good that ever came to anyone on the planet has been to be reconciled with their God. And we are called to be ministers of that good news. The greatest good that came into your life, no matter who you are, and I don't need to know who you are, or your story, is that you were, if you're in Christ, it is that you came to be reconciled to your God. And so we are part of this. So it means the call is be reconciled to God. We minister that kind of reconciliation. So again, if you have uh, friends, neighbors, even yourself as you're thinking, how do I bring care into my life? My marriage is a wreck. We minister reconciliation. We do not minister just we need to get a husband and a wife to get along. That's nice when they do. But no more than parents and kids get along. That's also nice when they do. 
But we can be so distracted by that and forget that that's not, what you, that's not your job. Your job is actually not that. That may come as fruit of the main job, which is husband, wife, be reconciled to God. Understand what the purpose of marriage is and then function in that way. And actually, things might get more tense for a time. It may feel like you have an enemy in the home that doesn't like you because you're bringing that person and pointing that person towards reconciliation with God. None of it will make sense without this. If we just narrow in and have a narrow view of, I just need to bring some care to this family dynamic, you know, this work relationship or church relationship, it won't make sense. At best, it will be weak. It won't be gospel reconciliation. None of it will last without understanding first, what does it mean to be reconciled to God? Parents dealing with children, it's like, where are they at with God right now? What is this showing about their heart? Not, let's just get things right. Let's just have peace in the home. Isn't it nice to have peace in the home? Amen. But we're in the business of pointing people to Christ, of being ministers of reconciliation. You were made new and reconciled to God through Christ to minister hope. We were called to minister hope. And, and I think there's many believers that are ministering weak hope. It's just like a weak gospel, the gospel of and many good things, but not Christ. We're ministers of hope, of reconciliation, of that is true change, of conversion, you could say. And it's a work of God. It's a work of God. So again, conversion's a work of God, and he converts the old to the new. Secondly, God converts the debtor to the free. So we've been given this ministry of reconciliation and now Paul in verse 19 is going to go on and he's going to just kind of drill down and basically say like, let me show you what that kind of looks like. He says, you're a minister of this, so let me show you kind of what that means. And he says, that is, here it is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. There it is. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So one thing that we see there for sure is we notice it is God we must be reconciled to. Here it is. You're ministering reconciliation. You have to think first and foremost, this person has to be reconciled with God. You, you cannot be content with them being reconciled with other things. Primarily, you can't be content with it. You might be like, that's good. But first and foremost... They need to be reconciled to God. He was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. So secondly, notice who we owe. God wasn't counting our trespasses, the world's trespasses against them. Meaning, those who would come in Christ, come to him, sorry, and be in Christ, not going to be counted. We don't owe Satan. You know, make a deal with the devil, that kind of stuff, or... You know, somehow we, we owe him something. We, you owe him nothing. You owe God. We owe God. And so he says he didn't count their sins against them. You and I owe God. So God, the good news of the gospel is that God saves you from God. And if God saves you from God, then you are changed. Then you are reconciled. Then it is a good work. So again, what do we owe? What is counted against us? Well, that would be last Sunday for sure. We looked at that. Romans 6, 23, I'll read this. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we owe. Eternal punishment in hell. Scripture describes it as the worm that never dies. Eternal punishment in hell. That's what you need to pay. That's what you owe because of your sin. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We owe God and God makes the payment through Christ. It's, it's incredible. At some levels, it's just mind-blowing. And at other levels, it's really simple. We owe God an infinite debt and he has paid it off. Now, how does that happen? Again, Romans 6.23 kind of shows us. I think it's interesting if you think about the weight of the debt, and, and our flesh doesn't like to think about it. We do not like to count on it long, and in some ways it's uncomfortable to preach about it. To think about an eternity in hell and the worm that never dies. 
So dying but not dying, suffering apart from God, eternal forever and ever and ever and ever without an end and ever and ever and it won't ever, ever stop. How do you pay that off? We looked at it last Sunday. You either pay it off in hell or Christ pays it off. But someone's paying it. Now, I don't know if this is exactly right. We understand debt. We've all got our different debts. If it's mortgage, credit card, I don't know, vehicle. Apparently, the Canadian national debt is around $1 trillion. It's a lot anyhow. It almost doesn't matter when it's that high. So I did look up $1 trillion, And so $1 trillion is $1 million million. So if you're going to pay off that debt, uh, you, all you have to do is, <laughs> is pay $1 million every year towards the debt without interest. And in a million years, you'd pay it off. A million years. Like, we don't understand the debt, I think, sometimes that we owe. And, and we think, oh, that's possible. Look, the Canadian debt's not possible. The debt we owe against God, hear this, it's not possible to pay off. No one changes that. It, it, the, the change doesn't happen by any work of man. No one says, I'm debt-free because of something that you did. It's an impossible thing that needs to change, but can't with man. We owe God. The debt is sin. It's paid only by our death for all eternity, never ending suffering apart from him in hell. And again, though, only those who are in Christ will have the debt paid. Why? It won't be counted against them. Why? Paul says that. He says, it won't be counted against. Why? Because it's counted against Christ. He pays it in full. I love that theology. He He bore it completely on the cross. He pays the debt complete. He said it is finished. He didn't say, I got it most way, finish it off. The debt is paid. The change is complete. You are not counted against. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Does anyone know how far that distance is? Anyone got a tape measure? How far is the east from the west? Kids, maybe you can think of this. Brain teaser. How far is the east from the west? Is there a tape measure big enough? What God is saying is it's infinite. There is no end. You go east, you go west, you keep going, you never end. That's how far he takes our transgressions away from us. He's making the point. It's gone. I don't count it against you. It's unbelievable. This is a a work of God. Conversion, this change from a debtor to free is a work of God. And so... He says in verse 19, again, so you have a job to do and it's not paying your debt off. He says, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He's entrusted us this message, this ministry and this message, the same thing. So the message isn't live like you're debt free. The message for us as we care for people and one another isn't, hey, you should live Uh, like you're debt-free, it's first of all, be debt-free and then live like you're debt-free. Live like it's true. And we're tempted to live uh, just with it. And and this, so this goes for the saved and the unsaved. Okay, the unsaved to just live with it. They feel the debt, maybe by God's grace, they feel guilt and they're just like coping with it. Just being busy and just like, ah, just kind of deal with it. This is uncomfortable, but I can get by. And as Christians, I'd say the same. It's tempting for us to be like, Look, you hear the truth, you are debt-free, but then just kind of like deal with the sin that you're still in and not repent and turn. And just like, I just deal with it. Yeah, yeah, debt-free and I'll just, this feels like a weight, a burden, guilt. I feel this, this, this debt, I am free, but you just deal with it and you live as if you're not. Tempted just to try and clear the debt. We're tempted to that. You feel times where you're like, man, I'm broken. I've fallen. It's like living in my old ways and you're tempted. I need to clear this debt. Make things right. Before Christ, people do this all the time. They try to lower the debt. It's not one trillion. It's actually, it's maybe just like a couple hundred thousand. You know, like I, I did pretty well. It's not that bad. We do these things and it just keeps us away from true conversion. The message again is be debt free. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't just try harder. Don't ignore it. It can't be paid off. It can't be lowered. I would say this for us as believers then. It's 
what message are we giving to the lost? You know, is it just like trying to just medicate like, oh, I, you probably feel guilty, you shouldn't feel guilty. Uh, let's let, lower the weight of that debt. Try to distract people, uh, compliment them on what they're doing. Or do we let them feel the weight of it so they can know actual true change that they need? And if you're in Christ today, then you've been changed and you are debt free. And you need to be reminded of that today. I need to be reminded of that today. I am debt free. Debt free. And so when I'm tempted to try to prove myself to God, God forgive me, I need to repent of that. Come back to him and remember I'm debt free. When I am in sin, I'm not incurring a debt now, but what I'm doing is I'm living as if I'm a debtor. You need to repent again and you come. You don't just tolerate it. You come and you live free because you are. Conversion's a work of God and he takes us from being debtors to free. Lastly then, God converts the unrighteous to the righteous. So old to new, debtors to free, and then the unrighteous to the righteous. And so he finishes these last two verses. He says in verse 20, therefore, again, therefore. Remember, what's it there for? Because you're reconciled to God, therefore, here it is. We are ambassadors for Christ. He's kind of given us the details of the work to do, and now he's like, here's the title. <laughs> this is what you're called. Ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we're converted. And we're given a new title. If you're in Christ, this is your title, ambassador. An ambassador was a representative to the king. You represent someone higher up. A messenger to the king. So we are messengers, we are ministers of the king. Be reconciled to God. And he says, verse 20, God makes his appeal through us. He makes his appeal through us. And so, Again, this is gloriously good news that we would uh, be counted with this title, that we would have the opportunity to give true change to people that need it, to remind ourselves, sometimes be an ambassador to ourselves to remind us of where tr true change comes from. Maybe you think when you hear this, you think of someone else, ambassadors for Christ, and maybe you think Pastor Kyle, or you think someone beside you, or at home, or whatever. Or you think, well... I'm not sure that's really for me. I'm not really sure I'm much of an ambassador. I mean, that sounds good, but I don't think that's really my title. Well, it's kind of like the, the father that says, I'm just not much of a father. I, I didn't have really a great father, and I'm just not really ready for this. Uh, you don't have that authority. If you're a father, then you need to father. <laughs> it's your title. The husband that says, like, I'm just I'm not really a good leader, uh, I'm, I'm growing in it. I hope one day I can be the leader I need to be. And the problem is, uh, that's not your authority. You've been given a title. You, you are the husband, meaning you are the leader. So it is good that you've been given that. The question is not like, am I the leader? Am I the husband? It's, are you going to act like it? We feel like, I'm just not a representative of God. I just don't know. Well, maybe you need to begin to be one, like act like one, but you are one. That is your title. That's our title. And if we think it's something else, or we say, I don't know, it's something else, and we're really, we're telling God you got it wrong. It's just pride. And now we're being useless for the kingdom in this way to bring true change to people who need change, who need to be converted. We are ambassadors. So what's the criteria? Maybe you see it in the passage. What's the criteria? Think on this. The criteria is what? It's a work of God. It's Paul was an apostle. He was an ambassador. This is certainly he's speaking of himself. But he also needed the same thing we need, which brings the criteria, which is to be born again, which is to be converted. That's the criteria. Are you new? Are you debt-free? Then your title is ambassador. It's that. Reconciled to God and now an ambassador. And so with the job title comes great urgency and we see this for sure. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. We beg you. I'm like, well, it's my title. I'm an ambassador. So uh, if I got time, if I get around to it, 
If you ask me who my best friend is, I might say something. No, 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 like I'm begging you. I'm begging you, you need to hear this. Be reconciled to God. You need to hear it. It's, it's again, like, I think we can look at this title and be like, hey, that's my title. Like, like and uh, if, if you're one of the highway workers holding signs, um, you know, hey, praise God, you're getting a paycheck. But sometimes it's like, really? Like, what in the world am I doing? Is this really helpful? Does it mean anything? If you are a surgeon at a children's hospital, you might say there's a little bit more urgency to that. Man, that title alone comes with a weight. You better take your title seriously. I don't know if it's really me today. And I, I want you to take it seriously if you're working on my kid. And with this comes great urgency. And he says, we beg you as an ambassador. And we have the message of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled. You have to be. I have to be. It's not optional. You know, I had to look this up because it's become foggy in my mind a little bit. It will come up again, no doubt. But if you remember, and I, don't, I think it was last year, the whole conversion therapy, Bill C6. You remember that? Okay, so here's kind of the gist of it. Interesting, the title. Right, and the enemy loves to work this way. Conversion therapy, right? It's like, that sounds actually like, yeah, that's okay. Like, this could be a good thing if we, if we hold to this, right? So conversion therapy is this, attempting to change someone's thinking from basically homosexual to heterosexual. That's really it. That's kind of like the gist of it. You're trying to convert somebody through therapy, you could say, uh, to not think that way, not do those things, and come this way. You can do the other way, that's fine. You can convert the other way. Convert a heterosexual to homosexual, that's fine. But not the other way is what the bill says. What I just want to say to that is, is this. We're not, first of all, as Christians, we're not in the business of just changing people. I'm not in the business of just getting someone to stop being living, I'll say, living homosexual and then living heterosexual. Uh, there'll be great benefits to that. Uh, that's, that's godly in many ways. It models the gospel in, in ways that homosexuality does not. So that is good. But we're not in the business of just changing someone. Hey, you just need to do this. We're in the business of conversion. Actual conversion. Not conversion therapy, just to, hey, don't live this way, live this way. But conversion therapy in the sense of gospel, of reconciliation, of being an ambassador to Christ, of Christ. We give hope to these people. That's much better than just live a heterosexual lifestyle. It's like be reconciled to God. And this, this life is perverting your view even of God and his love for you. And here's the thing is conversion, true conversion, is not an option. And so they're telling us that you can't do this, which is just surface and, and behavioral change anyhow. What I'm telling us is don't get distracted by that. In that sense, we're not in that business anyhow. We're in the business of being ambassadors of Christ and being, bringing true change. Be reconciled to God. And that's not an option that we give out to people. It's not just a preference. And we're like, hey, I'm kind of into this. You should be into that too. This is from God. Be reconciled to God. He says it from his word. And it's the hope of the world. This is the true change that we need to preach. Not just from the pulpit, but each one of us. This is our preach. The old person can be made new. The dead are free. The unrighteous counted righteous. And he says here, the plea is be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to your God. The person that doesn't know him yet is, let me tell you about your God. Be reconciled to God. Through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's not an option, and yes, it's urgent. It's urgent. It's urgent because we need to be with God, not just because we need to stop living homosexual. Not just because you need your marriage to not be so annoying. You need to be with God and living with Him. So listen here again. You must be converted. It's a work of God. And then look at verse 21. Paul now gives us kind of a glimpse into like 
how this kind of happens, what actually takes place. And so he says, for our sake, he made him. So God the Father made him, the Son, to, listen, be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I don't know if you can see that there. One person becomes sin. The other person becomes righteousness. And so there's an illustration. I've used this before. i use it again this morning, and hopefully it is a help to you. That's called the great exchange. And that's what's taking place here. There's an exchange. One person becoming sin, the other person becoming righteousness. In fact, the word reconciliation means exchange. There's an exchange going on that brings peace. It's really what it means. I'll give you this, you give me that, hey, we're good. To be reconciled. And so we have a, we just click through that, Brandon, the first circle, that's God, and just the visual there, holy, okay? In, like perfectly clean, not a spot of sin in him. He's holy, 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 that's our God. And then the second is us. Now, this is how we typically view ourselves, is we have some sin in us. We're not holy, holy, holy. I know I've done some things. This morning wasn't good. Uh, and we kind of view our, ourselves as like got spots and blemishes all over us. But the Word of God says, no, no, no. It's actually much worse than that. And so this is a better picture of what it is. There's not one part of us that's not infected with sin. Completely perverted by sin. It's not Darth Vader, hey, there's some good still left in you, that kind of stuff. This is completely sinful, no good in you, every bit of you worthy of the wrath of God. And then so we have Christ, right? And so Christ comes into the picture. Why does this matter so much? Because we see in verse 21 what Christ does. He does the exchange. There is no way that you can be changed from the position that you're in apart from the work of Jesus Christ and what Christ did on the cross is not just courageously die on a cross. People have been crucified forever. It's not a new thing. People do courageous things all the time to die. He did what no one could do, which took courage that no one has but God, which was to bear the wrath of God. And so just an arrow going over that God says, I take your sin on to myself. And Scripture says, God says to us, he became sin. It's, it's at a level that's so complete, the language is strong, to say he became sin. It's not like he just took some of it or got most of it or it's like complete. And then he said it is finished when he died. Completed the work of bearing the wrath and he says, I take it. And then what does he do? He takes our sin, but there's an exchange. He gives us, and that's the second arrow going over. He credits to us his own righteousness, the righteousness of God that comes from Christ. Christ lived perfect, sinless, holy. And he says, I'm a perfect sacrifice to, to bear the sin, to take that, but then to credit you righteousness. And I love the thought again, and I've said this before, like the righteousness of God, that we would become the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of a pastor or the righteousness of your grandmother or whoever. It's the righteousness of God and not a step lower because it comes from God, because it comes from Christ. Man, that's good news. We need that. That is that is so affirming and so secure and so done. That's conversion. That's a change. So again, Redemption Church, we don't need to just make changes. We don't need to change. We need conversion. That's what we need. And the changes, in a sense, kind of come from that. That's a fruit of that. But it always comes back to how are you before God? It's a work of God. He takes the old, new, the dead are free, the unrighteous, righteous. That's a work of God. It's not a work of man. It's not a work of God and man. Reconcile to God, actual change. We're ministers and messengers. You've been given a title, ambassador. Again, it's a work of God. It's, it's a done work. It's good for us to know this. You know, maybe you grew, I grew up in a farming community uh, there's a term that became pretty well-known, and I think some of us probably know it, but uh, farmer fixed things. You ever heard that? That oh, was farmer fixed. Maybe you're all familiar with it. If you don't know, it's basically you fixed it, kind of, 
I mean, it's sort of getting the job done, and most of it's duct tape, typically. Right? What the Lord does with us is conversion, it's a change, and it's not a farmer fix. And he does not need our help in order to make it better, or make it true, or make it lasting. You need to know it's the good news of the gospel. He has made us new in Christ. He's converted us. He has reconciled us with God. And it's God's work. And so if it doesn't work, then God has failed or he's a liar or something worse. It is done. It is good. It's a work of God.